The French in Cherbourg told the Alabama they must await permission to enter the dry dock from the emperor. While awaiting this decision, the Kearsar sailed into Cherbourg Harbor. Sims was determined to fight. Recognizing a duel was imminent, Sims sent ashore the gold in his sea chest and the collection of chronometers he had seized from his prized ships. He requested and was granted a bunker full of coal. His crew were given a hearty breakfast. Then, under the escort of a French ironclad, Alabama prepared to meet her fate. At the sight of the Confederate ship, the Kearsarge turned and raced out to sea, drawing Alabama well out into international waters. Forty-five minutes later, she wheeled and steamed directly for the Confederate cruiser. Winslow hoped to engage her at close quarters where her cannons could not miss and her shells were short time to explode. The battle was now in full pitch. The two vessels under steam pursued each other, scribing seven full circles in the sea. Closing to about 500 yards, or 460 meters, the Alabama fired twice for every broadside from the Union ship. As the battle raged, the gunners of the Alabama watched with desperate frustration as their shots bounced off the hull of the Union sloop. It eventually dawned on them that the Kearsarge was armored, her sides protected by lengths of massive anchor chain bolted on her sides. Alabama had no such protection, and her guns and rigging were being systematically shot away. At last, Wounded and dazed, her decks washed with blood, Sims gave the order to strike their colors. His men, wharf rats from Liverpool, screamed for him not to surrender, but the deed was done. To her discredit, Kearsarge fired again even after Alabama's colors had dipped in surrender. As the ship began sinking beneath him, Sims ordered the longboat loaded with wounded and sent to Kearsarge for assistance. The first mate gave the order to abandon ship. Sims and his crew found themselves in the water while the dead went to the bottom with the famous ship. The great warrior slipped beneath the waves of the English Channel, never having seen the Republic for whom she had battled so bravely. Alabama sank on June 19, 1864. Most people considered that that was the last that would ever be seen of the famous Confederate raider. But her fame, the circumstances of her loss, inspired many searches, including one in 1984, when Clive Cussler decided to take a look, but was prevented from doing so by the French government. Little did Clive know that at the same time he was engaged in looking for Alabama, the French government itself was also looking. On October 30th, 1984, a French Navy mine hunter, Siosse, located the wreck of Alabama, seven nautical miles off Cherbourg, in 58 meters of water. It took four years before the French were able to go back and start doing detailed archaeological work. Surveying Alabama on the bottom, particularly in the darkness, is much like trying to map a city block by block with only a flashlight in your hands in the midst of a blinding snowstorm. Despite that, through the years, what the French found and documented is a wreck lying on her side about 20 degrees to starboard. Her boilers, still intact, have prevented much of the hull structure in that area from being destroyed by the current. But at both ends, at both the bow and the stern, much of the ship has been stripped away. The most important thing in archaeology is remembering that everything you do can't be reversed. If you excavate or bring something up, you can never go back down and dig it up again. It's like having a bank account in which you can only make withdrawals, but not deposits. So, you are very careful and methodical. Then you move in and you start your actual excavation using underwater dredges, such as our French colleagues are using in the footage. That gives you a chance to slowly, carefully move away sediment, to recover artifacts as they're uncovered on the bottom, to document, to draw, and to photograph them in place, and then to bring them up carefully 
as you continue down through the layers of history that were left as the ship slowly disintegrated and fell into itself on the seabed. By diving Mary Celeste and Nola, by looking at all the footage of Alabama, for me, it's a reminder of the fun, the privilege, the excitement of being an underwater archaeologist. Not only are you diving and seeing these things, you're interacting with the past in a very personal way. And that personal interaction allows you, in a very unique way, to go back in time and interact with those who came before you. It gives you insights into those people. It gives you insights into the passions that fueled them, and in some cases, of their very last moments. For the French team excavating Alabama, it was particularly poignant, because as they worked on the recovery of the ship's Blakely gun, what they found was that the gun had been lost just at the moment it was being loaded with a shell and a fuse. But that loading had been interrupted. Why? Because at the very last, just as those men were ramming that shell home to fire one last shot at the Kearsarge, the order came to surrender and soon to abandon ship. And within a few moments, Alabama was on her way to the bottom. That's drama. That's the reality of underwater archaeology.